Baker, and he's going to be speaking on uh, risk management in a digital world. So um, he, just to let everyone know, he is over in Texas, and Texas is, uh, like New Mexico, is getting slammed. So they are having some rolling blackouts and uh, uh, dealing with some issues in the entire state. So uh, we're going to go as long as possible if perhaps his... Uh, his power goes out, he uh, is going to try to call in. Um, if that does happen, we will still have the slideshow to show you why he calls in. Um, and then again, if uh, we still have some challenges, we'll reschedule, but right now everything looks great. And uh, uh, again, if you have any questions, Eric has told me that he loves to answer questions all the way through it. Um, raise your hand, yep. Bring, bring it on, uh, add them into the Q&A, add them into the chat, raise your hand if you'd like to talk. And uh, without further ado, Eric, take it away. Okay, well, once again, I'd like to welcome all of you. And I want to keep this informative, but I also want to keep it entertaining. But once again, I want to keep it informative. So ask your questions and you can use chat to do that. That's probably one of the easiest ways uh, is just type your question in chat. We are monitoring it, uh, and that way uh, they, the moderators can ask me the question and we'll jump right in. Do not wait for the end of this. Ask them at any time. That's what this is about. Uh, I wanna make it where, as if I was standing right in front of you and you just wanna ask a question. So let us jump right into it and talk about risk management. Now this is so appropriate, especially today. Uh, as, as they probably told you, I'm in Texas, up in Amarillo, Texas, and it's like 15 degrees. Uh, it was way below zero earlier. And this morning, the power company just turned our power off. We didn't lose power. They turned it off for about an hour and a half. It's the first time uh, I've ever seen a rolling blackout. The whole state is going through them right now. Uh, and so I'm praying that they don't cut it off during this. But if they do, I'll call back in. No big deal. But the reason I bring all that up is not to get any sympathy. It's to show you that what we're about to talk about is important because you never know when you're going to need to mitigate those risks, when you're going to need to be able to handle that. And you see, we have a plan B just in case that happens. And I'm going to talk to you about how digital changes things a little bit. Let's talk about risk in the real world. I mean, Heck, all you have to do is type 2020 and you'll see just about all the risks there are. Uh, it's been crazy. Uh, and all sorts of things can affect your business. Uh, things you may not expect, things that are once in a generation, once every 10 years, once 100 years, you never know, but it's best to be prepared. So floods and fires is one of the big ones. Uh, you just never know. Here in Amarillo, flooding is not that big of a deal. But a lot of you, uh, I know where y'all live, and y'all do live in areas that get a lot more rain or a lot more hilly, and so water tends to gather. So if you've never thought about a flood or if you don't live in a floodplain, you may not even be worried about it. But if you were to have a really heavy storm that's never happened in 100 years, and you know good and well that's going to happen this year at last, you know, then you need to be ready for that. What are you going to do? How are you going to mitigate that risk? Riots and crime, and yes, we've seen that too, unfortunately, uh, can definitely affect your business. Uh, what are you gonna do if that happens? Uh, how are you going to, if you know what's about to happen, how are you gonna mitigate those risks? How are you going to limit those risks? Internal sabotage uh, can be another big one. We all know uh, of companies that have had um, an angry ex-employee, and some of these people don't think, and they will pull something. And let me just tell you, because I have a computer degree, that's my background, is like I'm a computer programmer. And if you hire, and I'm not saying anything against technical people, because I love them to death, I am one, but just trust me, of all the employees who work for you, the one you should most be scared of being angry and spiteful is your computer person, okay? Uh, and it's not, uh, once again, I'm not throwing them all under the bus. We are great people. But of all the people that can harm you digitally the most, that's going to be the vector it comes from. If, if we're talking internal sabotage. 
And of course, the pandemic. Uh, no one saw it coming. I mean, it's it wasn't even one of those once in a hundred years things. No one said it was coming. We it just happened. And so a lot of us had to suddenly realize what are we going to do to stay in business? And moving forward, we're going to have to do that again. And we're going to have to make decisions. And insurance companies are having to make decisions uh, about what those kind of risks are and what they're worth. So yeah, your insurance rates are probably going to go up um, for uh, those kind of events. But like I said, you've got to decide what we're going to do. And a lot of you have figured out, just like we're doing here, we're going to use distance technology. And so that has suddenly taken a jump. And I think you're going to see more and more of that happening, even after all of this is over. Well, let's jump into it, because this is really about risk in the digital world. OK. A server crash, that is a huge one. Can I tell you how big that is? Uh, I've been with companies, in fact, every company um, I've worked with or worked for, uh, either having them as a customer or as an employer, I swear I've seen server crashes. And when that happens, basically everything stops. If all their data is in that one machine and everyone is accessing that one machine, then when it goes down, it's down. Uh, and everyone pretty much just has to throw up their hands. I know a lot of people think, oh, that's why we should keep filing cabinets. Why should we ever go to computers? Shut up. You don't get to crawl out of the woodwork and say that this is why servers are no good. No, I'm going to be giving you some good ideas here. And you got to realize that technology is good. But like everything, even Superman, it has kryptonite. And you've got to know what that weakness is before it happens. I tell people all the time, when you buy servers, when you buy technology for your company, one of the questions you have to ask the vendor is, what are we going to do if it stops working? What is plan B? How long does it take to, to fix it? How long does it take to replace it? How long until we get back up and running? So keep in mind, you've got to ask the right questions. Stolen data is another big one. We see this happen so often. Um, I remember I had an uh, ex-employee steal all my customer data. Uh, they just copied it and put it on a disc at the time, just a long time ago. And they went and started their own company. It didn't work though, uh, because it was so obvious what they did. And uh, legally, let's just say they stopped doing it. But that's my point. It doesn't take much these days. All it takes is a thumb drive. All it takes is you know, someone emailing a file to themselves or to their personal account. And boom, they have a lot of it, your information. So. There's a, that's another risk that you're going to have to mitigate, and that is access uh, to that data. You know, I tell people all the time, what is, a, what, what is worth the most money in your business? And a lot of people say, oh, it's the people. Oh, that's the, that's the sweet thing you're supposed to say. Uh, some people say, oh, it's all the building, all the equipment and the factory. But let me just tell you the truth. Do you want to know the thing worth the most in your company? It's your data. It is your data. Over half the companies that lose their data go out of business. That is how much we depend on it today. Everything else can be replaced. People can be replaced. Buildings can be replaced. Factories, equipment can be replaced. Not your data. You'll either have to type it back in or start over. Okay? So you've got to understand what your risks are. Social media attack, this is a big one. And we're still seeing a lot of this. In other words, your someone in your company does something stupid online and says something. And then all of a sudden, your social media account for your company gets sucked into it. And your company, its reputation starts hurting because of an idiot mistake one of your people made. Uh, so we'll talk about that. Uh, we'll talk about what you don't need to be doing uh, as it relates to social media and what you need to tell your people to stop talking about. You know, a rogue employee post, like I said, this kind of goes with the same thing, but every once in a while, your, your employees may post something and it could be on your official account and it could be something totally legit, but everything needs to be looked at. Everything that goes that can be connected to your company needs to be looked at. 
a lot of times office dislocation uh, can be an issue. And we see that with floods and heck, if they don't stop these rolling blackouts, we might even see that with a few businesses uh, having to temporarily change their locations. Uh, the pandemic did that as well, uh, causing people to work from home instead of their offices. And I think one of the things you're gonna see is in the commercial office uh, environment, you're gonna see a lot fewer people renting office space. I think if there's anything that this pandemic has showed us about how to deal with risk, it's that with today's technology, we don't necessarily need an office, or at least not all of us. You may need somewhere for someone to walk into, like a customer service desk, but some of your people never see the light of day once they get to work and then leave. They can do that from home. So we're starting to see that office dislocation is another digital risk uh, that you never know. Maybe the pandemic actually got us ready for. So let's talk about a server crash. I tell people all the time, where is your data? I want you to point to me where your data is. You know, when I go in their business and they, they bring me in to do this kind of evaluation on their risks, that's the first question I ask, where's your data? And you would be surprised how many people don't know or how many people point to their own PC or laptop or phone. And then I'll realize that their corporate data, their, their company data is, they don't know where it is. And so the first thing I like to let, I like to find out is, okay, we, in order to protect it, we have to know where it is. Chances are uh, your data, depending on how old your company is, is located on proprietary internal servers, specialized computers that run really fast and are usually in, you know, off by themselves, no one's sitting at them in a room. Sometimes it's a cooled room because servers can get hot. You know, it's a protected machine sometimes, but the point is it's one machine. And if you have that kind of setup, then you, you know full good and well what the words server crash mean because you've experienced it. And a lot of times getting someone out to fix those servers quickly is, is next to impossible. So I tell people, if you have an internal server, you've got to ask yourself the questions. First, where is your data? Find it on the server. Number two, how old is the server? I tell people all the time, servers are only good for about four years. Only about four years. It's not that they stop working in four years. It's that they're no longer capable of keeping up with the software developed four years after they were built. Okay, they're just not powerful enough. Or since they've been running 24 seven for four years, they're about to go put. So I tell people all the time, you need to be replacing servers, buying brand new servers about every four years if you wanna stay safe. And keep in mind, servers aren't cheap. Good servers are anywhere from 4,000 to $12,000. So if you're trying to budget and you wanna keep an internal server, then you may wanna be budgeting at least every four years or spread it out amongst the four years, save up. Because at some point you're gonna to need to replace that sucker. Is your server updated? Is it protected? I've been in some uh, businesses where a tech person hasn't looked at the server in years. They set it up, they started it, it runs and it runs great. They've never had a problem. But the problem is, since it's been up all this time, it's never really downloaded any updates. The security in it is still the same as it was four years ago. And so therefore, it's wide open to attack, hack attack. And yes, we are seeing a huge amount of, a huge amount of that going on right now. What hackers will do is they will put out these little programs. And what these programs do is they're, they're constantly searching the internet, poking at all the servers they can find just to find out what version of the software they're using. And these automated robot software, it probably hits your server at least once a day. These automated, it's keeping up with that. And if they see that you're far enough behind, then the hackers know how to hack you. If they see that you're not updating your software, you know, updating your uh, antivirus, 
they know exactly how to get in there. And this little robot that's always out there looking is waiting for you to forget to fix that hole in the wall. And when it finds it, it's gonna go straight through it. Is your software up to date? The software itself, the software you use, not just the server, not just the server and the protection software, but also the software you use on a daily basis, your financial software, your, your customer contact software, whatever it is you use, whatever it is you depend on, is it up to date? I still see a lot of people who buy software once and then never update it because they don't want to pay all the extra money that comes with that. And so they just kind of keep it at that level. That's why when you call some of these, some of your software vendors, they're going to ask you what version are you on? Because they need to know what is it you're running into. If you're not updating that software, that means that when they do update it and you're not applying it to your server, you still have the same holes uh, that caused that to be fixed in the first place. And someone could take advantage of that. Is your server environmentally protected? Um, this sounds silly because a lot of you will say, it's not outside, it's not in the backyard. I'm not talking about that. I mean, first of all, is it off the ground? I mean, if you had a pipe burst in the ceiling and it put three inches of water on all of your floors, is your server sitting where would it get wet? I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen. These Some of these servers are so huge. Some, someone just sets it down on a cement floor and thinks, oh, we're safe. Uh, and, and then they have a problem. I've seen other people put servers on carpet and you never want to do that. Never set, a, never set a server on carpet because that static electricity, especially in the winter, when you're in there moving around, it can jump from the carpet to your server and can cause it to eat. And you just never know. I've seen that happen too. I had a situation where a customer kept saying during the winter, yeah, our server just keeps rebooting every time we walk in the room. That's exactly what it was. I told them just put a couple of boards down. It won't be pretty, but put anything down between that carpet, something that doesn't conduct electricity and put the server on it. You're good. So is it environmentally protected? We're also talking about heat as well. Uh, as we have rolling blackouts, guess what that means to server rooms that need it to stay at a certain level of protection? You know, does, does your air conditioner have backup? How long can it be out? And how hot will the server get while your air conditioner is out? You gotta protect your data. And if I can tell you one thing, the one, the one thing that will get you through all of this pretty much is if you move to the cloud. Please, please, I've been preaching this for years now. If you have not moved to the cloud, you need to, okay? Because here's the deal. Today's hackers are way more experienced and way more advanced. It's not just these little kids sitting in their parents' basement you know, little hackers like you see in Hollywood. No, today's hackers are countries. Today's hackers are looking for financial information and ways to take over your identity so that they can take out loans and get money. Trust me, is it is a huge terroristic and organized venture. And your company is ripe for the pickings. And so you know what servers are looking for? You know what uh, hackers are looking for? They are looking for companies that still have their own servers. Let me say that again. They are looking for companies that still have their own internal servers because those are the, that's the easiest stuff to hack. Uh, these, they're not, the hackers aren't after Google. They're not after Amazon, Apple and Microsoft and Visa and MasterCard. They're not after, they are not after them. Those are too hard, security too high. They've got PhD level security people who work there. Now, they want your little company.com in Amarillo, Texas. Because if you, chances are, you don't have a PhD level security person. You don't have, you know, the same level of resources that these larger companies have. It'll be an easy, it's easier to break into my house than it is to break into Fort Knox, if you get what I'm saying. Moving to the cloud. Now, for those of you asking, what's the cloud really? 
The cloud just means you're using someone else's servers. That's all. You're moving your data and you're renting space on someone else's servers and you're accessing that through the internet. That's all it means. That's all it means. You can either go to the cloud or you can upgrade every four years. I tell people all the time, if you move to the cloud, there's so many advantages. Number one, you never have to back up again because it's automatically backed up. Uh, and when you're on in the cloud, that job of not being hacked becomes their job, not yours. You know, it's, for instance, my data, all my customer data, everything I do is in the Google cloud, totally protected. Okay, only I have access to it. And my whole office could burn to the ground. My whole, all my computers could be stolen. And guess what? Not one bit of my customer's data is on those machines. Not one bit. A hacker wouldn't gain access to anything because my data is in the cloud. Also, I don't have to, I don't have to buy new servers all the time. I don't have to pay a tech person to set them up or fix them or back them up. I don't have to do any of that. Uh, another way of using the cloud, so to speak, is to do offsite backups. Uh, one of the biggest ones, and you've probably heard of them, is Carbonite. And you can find them at carbonite.com. Uh, and basically what it does is it sits on your PC or your server, if you want. And when you aren't using it, it's just slowly encrypting, you know, scrambling it, making it unreadable, and then sending it up to the cloud and stored there. And only you can access it. But even if someone else did access it, they would have to know the pass key to unscramble it. So it would just be a big mess to them anyway. So I highly recommend this. If, if you're not gonna do much, at least do offsite backups. Because like I said, even if your whole building burned to the ground, and I know some of you who do say that you do backups, you keep those backups pretty much next to the server, don't you? You don't take them home like you're supposed to. So I love Carbonite. It's easy. You don't have to think about it. And everything gets backed up. And you can actually download it anywhere you need to. Know all the passwords. If you own a company, chances are there's a lot of technology that you have. For instance, you probably have routers. You have PCs. You might even have a server. You have this, you have that. And if you, even if you are using the cloud, you probably have administration accounts into this software and that software and everything, all the email, everything has passwords. What happens in an emergency if you need to access something? I'm not saying you have to memorize every password that your company has. What I am saying is you need to be able to either find it or get around it quickly. I can't tell you how many times uh, someone calls me, their server has gone down and I say, okay, we log into it. And they don't know how to log into their own server as the administrator, not as them as a user, like they always have. I mean, as the administrator, someone who can actually fix it. If you're a business owner and you have your own server, you better know the administration password or at least have access to that password. Okay, and you need to find out what the password is on all your stuff, or at least have access to it. Because keep in mind, if you're depending on one person in your company to do that, you know, what happens when they leave? What happens when they get angry? What happens if they get hit by a bus tomorrow? That's all I'm saying. You gotta, you can't depend on other people when it comes to this information. You must be able to get at it without any help whatsoever. If not, you're creating a single point of failure. And as this pandemic and some of the riots and all the other stuff has proved to some of these companies, you will discover what your single point of failure is. You got to remove ex-employees from your system. I, I can't, I can't say that enough. I can't. In fact, I think one of your policies should be that when you are firing someone, while they are being fired, before they get back to their computer, they have lost all access to their stuff, okay? 
that all their passwords have been changed of everything they have access to. Because what you do not want is someone who has just been fired to have access. You don't know what people will do when they're panicking. You don't know what people will do when they get that angry. So like I said, the best policy is while they're in your office getting fired, someone else should be cutting them off or at least not letting them back into their office. I know some companies that when you get fired, you don't go back to your office. Someone packs it all up and sets it out. I mean, you just cannot give people this kind of access. You've got to remove ex-employees from your system while they're getting fired. Now, what if they're not firing? What if they're just quitting? And they give you two weeks. Okay. Can we talk? I am not a huge fan of letting people work for two more weeks. If they quit, they're gone that day. I don't care how nice they are. I don't care how sweet they are. I don't care how many of our customers love them. If they quit and give me two weeks, they're gone that day. And that's because the second someone tells you they're going somewhere else, especially to one of your competitors, their loyalties no longer lie with you. And they may have wonderful morals, wonderful ethics. I'm just saying your business is worth more than that. Okay. Any questions so far? Remember, you can chat them to me. I know some of you are feeding your face right now, and that's fine. Enjoy. But if you have a question, just ask. I have a question, Eric. So I am like, I like want to get off this webinar immediately and start working on my backups and data. What? What should I do first? Should I move to the cloud? Is that my number one thing I should do right off the bat? What are we, that's a great question. The first thing I would do is make a list, make an inventory of your critical software and then prioritize it, okay? Uh, say the most important thing that we use on regularly every day is this, okay? Now, where is that data? Now, good example, um, email is one of mine. One of my biggest things I use. I use Gmail. Now I use a business account on Gmail. So it has, you know, my ericspellman.com at the end and not gmail.com. But the point is my email is in the cloud. This presentation is in the cloud, by the way, on Google. Uh, financially, some of y'all may be using QuickBooks. And so that might be your priority software. I highly recommend you move to QBO, QuickBooks Online. QuickBooks does have a cloud version of its software. It works great. I've used it. Um, a lot. It just depends on what your software is. Everyone has specific software. Now, we'll be honest. Most software companies are only building are only building cloud software now, where you're subscribing to it, where you're paying a monthly fee for it or a per user fee for it, and not just paying a one time four hundred dollars for Microsoft Office. So make a, step one, I would say make a list of all the software you use and highlight the ones that are on a server near you or you know, somewhere not the cloud, okay? And then when you find the software that isn't in the cloud, I would call that software company and say, do you have a cloud version of it? Tell me more about it. And then what they will do, usually at no cost, is help you migrate your data from your server to theirs. And then you're accessing it from their system. Is that, did that answer your question? Yes, it did. So step one, take an inventory of your software. Step two, prioritize it. Step three, separate them into in the cloud, not in the cloud. Believe it or not, you can run your own, your entire company from the cloud. I've done it for over 10 years. So here's another question I have. So. Let's say I got a new laptop and I want to take all my stuff off my previous laptop. What do you suggest I do with the old laptop? Uh, you're not going to use it anymore. You're not going to give it to kids or anything like that. I may give it to kids or I may have it um, for if 
someone needs to use it or I may donate it. But I'm just wondering if you wipe it, um, if you wipe all the information off, is it still safe to give it to somebody? Yeah, what I usually recommend is there's usually a, a setting on that computer and every one of them is different where you can reboot it to factory. It'll erase the hard drive. It'll get it back to when you got it out of the box. So that'd be what I would do. Um, and you may have to Google that to figure that out. Um, but if it's so slow and you kept it way too long, you know, then I would just take a hammer to it. Uh, and I know that sounds funny, but I mean it. I mean, destroy that thing uh, and then just throw it away. So we do have a question coming in. Um, how does asking, I didn't get what you said about QB. QuickBooks? Okay. QuickBooks uh, has a cloud version called, yeah, I call it QBO. It's QuickBooks Online. And if you do a search on that on Google, you'll find it. And they have a monthly fee and they just, they give you access to it and you can have multiple people logged into it and you can access it from any computer with internet connection and it's secure, just like your main. Uh, it's the only way to do QuickBooks because I remember when I used to use QuickBooks, I could only use the computer it was installed on. And that was a pain. Uh, and so, but now I can access it from any machine, including my phone, uh, if I need to. I can, I mean, back before the pandemic, I was traveling all over the place and I could run my entire company from my phone. Uh, it's just, and I have. <laughs> so the more you get in the cloud, the more options you get, the more flexibility you get. And so QuickBooks has one of the best online financial pieces of software I've seen. And I hope that answered your question. Because if you, when you said QB, if you meant quarterback, I don't know much about football. Here is a follow-up question for that. I have a monthly fee account. So is it safe? How about security on phone? Yeah, it's safe. And the way to know if it's safe is you look up in your browser, you know, whether you're using Chrome or Firefox or Internet Explorer or whatever. And next to the web address, you'll see that little lock padlock. It's using the same, and I mean the same security and encryption as when you check your own bank account online. And I know you do. So if you trust it to check your bank account online, the same security is being used to check that online. That's all we got for now. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, stolen data. <sighs> Who has access to your data in your company? Sometimes out of convenience, we let every, you know, down to the receptionist, having full access to everything. Excuse me. Uh, full access to everything, because how many times have you called in and said, oh, I need you to pull this file and give me this or open this spreadsheet and tell me that. So you said to heck with security, I'll just give them full access so I don't run into this again. Well, remember, when it comes to security, it's always a balance between convenience of access and security. Whenever you increase convenience, you drop security. Whenever you increase security, you lose convenience. You know, Amarillo, what, what a lot of people don't know about Amarillo, Texas, is that we are home to Pentex. One of our largest employers has over five, 6,000 employees. And it is the primary assembly and disassembly and upgrading point for all the nuclear weapons in the United States. Okay, it's called Pentex. And it is, as you could well imagine, it is highly secure. And I can't just walk up to it. I can't just walk up there and walk right in. I have no convenience to get in. Why? Because the security is so high. However, here in Amarillo, we have public parks. The convenience is high because I don't have to ask permission. I don't have to know a password. I can just walk into the park. But what about security? There's hardly any security in a public park. So you always need to realize when giving people access to data, okay, you are trying to balance convenience versus security. And just realize if you let someone know the master password, if you give someone your PC login because you're out of town and you need this information right away. 
when you give them that, yes, you're increasing convenience, but you're also decreasing security, okay? And you have to make that call and you have to know that when you're doing it. And not everyone needs to be the administrator. Not everyone needs to have all full rights. Most software lets um, certain people be the administrator. And one of the biggest mistakes a lot of companies make is their tech guy is the administrator. And the owner of the company is just a user. Oh my gosh, huge mistake. Because what happens if the tech guy gets hit by a bus? You have no way in to your own software. The owner of the company must have or have access to an administrative account into everything in that company. And I mean everything. And some of y'all are going, oh my gosh, he's 94 years old. I wouldn't trust him with that. I don't care. Put it in a book. Put it in a safe. But you've got to have that access. Uh, the owner of the company has always has to have a fallback. Always. You can't, you can't leave it up to your tech guys. Okay. What's your policy on thumb drives and laptops? You know, what is your company going to do? Do you allow employees to just bring them in all the time? Do you allow people to plug in and just take data with them all the time? Do you have company laptops? Is the data stored on those laptops? Or are your employees just using them to access the internet, to access over the cloud your company data? If one of your laptops gets stolen or left on a baggage carousel in an airport, could someone open it up and remove the hard drive and maybe get some of your customer information? Do you not know? If you don't know, you need to find out. I have over about four laptops that get used and not one of them has any of my customer data on them, but I can use any of them to access that data. So yeah, and I actually had three laptops stolen from my company once. And I didn't even have to tell my customers that any of their data was compromised. Why? Because it wasn't, not one bit. I just lost some equipment. I didn't lose data. Thumb drives. I know what some of y'all are about to ask me. You're about to say, is there a way we can keep people from downloading our company data? There are, but I'll be honest, if someone really wants it, they're gonna get it, okay? Even if they take out their phone and take a picture of the screen they're looking at, okay? It's almost impossible to 100% protect your data like that. So you just need to have a policy about thumb drives policy about data leaving your servers uh, and basically saying that if that shouldn't your that data should not be at home without special permission that data those thumb drives have to be inventoried you know you can't they can't use personal thumb drives with company data or personal laptops you see what i'm saying you need to make some policies on that because when it does happen and it will unfortunately when some of your data does get lost that way or stolen or compromised, you want to make sure that at least you can show that you had a policy trying to stop that. That's how a lot of lawsuits come around is when companies don't have policies. Okay, physical security. What's it take to get into your company? You know, I say, and I'm sure everyone goes, oh, no, we have an alarm system and lock it up at nine. We're real good about that. We have cameras inside. Da, da, da. Yeah, but what about at lunch? You want to know when the majority of outside people steal data or steal anything from a company? It's at lunchtime right now. Basically, what's happening is this. If I wanted to steal something from your company, here's what I would do. I would go out, probably go to Goodwill, get a solid brown outfit, brown shirt, brown pants, brown hat, and then write UPS on it. And then I might get a clipboard and a little, uh, a little push cart. And I would walk into your company and with some empty boxes on it. 
And I, I've already gone to your website, so I know who the key people who work there are, and say, hey, uh, this is for so-and-so, your boss. And he said, because it's so heavy, could I just drop it in his office? And chances are the front desk person, because they heard me mention the boss's name and that I had permission, and they're not going to call their boss over his lunch and bug him. Guess what? They're going to let me walk right into the boss's office. And I have a good hour before the boss gets back. And I can sit at his desk. I can put thumb drives in, do whatever I need to do, and walk out. Why? Because I'm just a UPS guy. And everyone's used to seeing him walk around their offices. So realize that it's not just about cameras. It's not just about deadbolts. And most of the data loss doesn't happen after hours. It happens at lunch. You gotta protect that data. You gotta limit data access, like I said. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta limit who has access to your data. It can't be a one and done. In fact, I often, Tell people as you grow as a company and add more employees, you need to sit down and reevaluate uh, your security and reevaluate access to data. Just like you have to reevaluate office designs and offices and desks and chairs and how many offices you have and all that, you need to also look at security in the same way and in the same light. Limit data access to only those people who need it. And if you have to momentarily Give someone access to something, take it back. As soon as they're done with it, take it back. So many times we give someone a password and then we forget we gave it to them and they still have it. And then we never change the password and we never even realize they have full access to everything. There can only be one admin account, okay? Uh, only one admin and that needs to be the boss. That needs to be the person who runs everything. Yeah, I guess your tech could be one if you really, really trust them. But the boss, the person, keep in mind, who is the one person who has the most motivation to keep the business running, the most loyalty to the business, the one least likely to sabotage the business? It's the owner. They're the ones who need to have the keys to the kingdom. Manage your removable data, your removable media. And I don't just mean thumb drives and I don't just mean laptops. I'm talking everything, including people plugging their phones into their computers at work, saying they're charging them. But you can also copy data between phones and the computer as well. And I even, I've even seen some news reports of people that did that, saying they were just charging their phone. But in reality, it was plugged into their computer and they were copying large and large amounts of files onto their own phone. And because it wasn't a thumb drive, because it wasn't a laptop, no one thought anything about it. You've got to manage it. And the only way you can manage it, I'm not, once again, I'm going to tell you, it's not by getting software to prevent thumb drives. It's policy. Policy. Okay. Lock the server room, lock the server room, lock the server room, lock the server room. If you are a company that has a room with computers in it, can anyone walk up to it and just open the door and walk in? Anyone? I have seen that before and they do that for convenience because they think the only people back in that area of the company are going to be loyal people. But once again, you've got to remember the whole UPS guy scenario. You know, you've got to lock that server room. And I know a lot of people who put a code key on it. You know, you enter a key or they use a card system. If you use a code key system where you enter a little four digit code to get in, guess what happens when someone quits who had that code key? You got to change it. And some people never do. There's some old companies that I've done work with that I know good and well. I could walk right in, go into their server room and probably even log into the server as administrator. And this is years later. Okay. Luckily, I'm a good person and wouldn't do that, but not everyone is, and you have to act like no one is. Social media attacks. Some people ask, why do I even put this in risk management? Because it is. This risk can affect your business in a big way, okay? 
And this risk can come from a lot of different places. Many times it could be an embarrassing picture, okay? A picture that someone has, and what do they do? They post it to your Facebook account, you know, your, your business Facebook page maybe, uh, or it just starts making the rounds and it's tagged with you. Um, what are you gonna do about that? I, I tell everybody, if I'm gonna hire you, and, and some of y'all are gonna think this is so draconian and none of my business. But here's what I will do to protect my business. I'm gonna ask you to friend me on Facebook, even if we are friends, I'm just your employer, but I'm gonna ask you to friend me. That way I can go back through and look at all of your stuff as your boss, because I don't wanna find anything that my company is gonna get burned on because of you. Okay, trust me, I've seen it happen a dozen times. And where you're gonna see it happen these days has to do with people making mistakes and saying something racist, saying something bigoted, saying something that you don't want associated with your company, okay? And social media, unfortunately, and I have a whole talk on this I wanna go over someday, we get into this mindset that all of our friends on Facebook, all of our friends on social media believe the way we do. They do not, okay? And when you start mixing your company into that, it gets crazy. I, I, tell, I tell people all the time, keep in mind when you are posting something on Facebook that's controversial, especially if you're the business owner, it can come back to bite you. Now, as long as you realize that, post all you want. But you have to realize that. And you have to realize that not everyone who reads what you post is going to agree with you. And anyway, just realize that everyone is your customer and you don't want to have to lose customers because of something stupid. Racism or political, that's what we're seeing a lot of right now. You can call it cancel culture. You can call it whatever you want. But the point is, real companies are going out of business because of stupid stuff their employees are doing. Okay, you've got to have a policy in place. If you don't want to be as draconian as me and be friends with all your employees, you can see their Facebook. If, if, you, want, uh, if you want to be a little less than that, then have a policy on the books. Because keep in mind, you do have the legal ability to fire somebody if what they said on Facebook has a negative impact on your business. You as a business owner have the right to do that. Okay, um, so first of all, try to hire people that won't do that, to, won't post stuff like that anyway. But if you do, and if one of your employees gets drunk one night and goes off on a social media rant and it, and it kind of goes viral and it becomes a big deal, you need to let that employee go immediately. I hate to say it. I hate to say it, this is called risk mitigation. And when someone breaks that, you've got to cut them loose. If you don't cut them loose, the pressure will grow on your company, okay? So I know it doesn't sound fair and I know some people are gonna talk First Amendment. This has nothing to do with the First Amendment. This has everything to do with your business's reputation. And whether they meant it or not, another person's actions, one of your employees, if it affects your reputation negatively for your company, they're gone, okay? Questions on that? Because I know that's a pretty touchy subject, especially these days with all the politics. What if they just share something onto their Facebook page? Would that be the same thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, you sharing something is the same as posting it because basically you're saying, I agree. When you share something, you're saying, I agree. So you are, and if, I, if the vice president of my company were to post something racist, I would cut him loose, even if he'd been with me for 30 years, because I can't have that. The most important thing is my company in the end, okay? I can't have that. And you as a business owner have got to step away from the emotions of it. You've got to step away from the emotions of whether they had the right to say what they wanted to say. 
Everyone has the right to say what they want to say, but also they have the right to experience the consequences for what they said. Remember that. Angry ex-customers are another big one. Uh, you, I mean, every if you've been in business very long, you're going to have an angry customer or two. And depending on how technologically savvy they are will determine what they end up doing. A lot of times they may try to mess up your reviews, you know, post into your reviews, false reviews, trying to drag your review rating down. You never know what they're going to do. But I'm telling you right now that the, the way you handle that is very simply. When you see someone, an angry ex-customer, really talking bad about you on social media, you need to reply to them as the company and say, I'm so sorry you had that experience. Um, you know, please come back in and we'll try to make it better. Now, after you do that, you post that publicly. Then what you're going to do is you're going to DM them, direct message, send a private message to them and say, hey, here's my phone number. Call me right now. Let's get to the bottom of this. I want to fix it. If they ignore you and they keep talking garbage on you, then they're a troll. And then you can just block them. But step one is to try to fix it. Okay. You have to determine whether they're doing this out of spite and keep doing it no matter what you do or whether they really need help. Okay. Competitor trolls. Yeah. And I've seen this happen before too. Uh, your competitors control you. I had that happen to me. Uh, I had a competitor write some fake reviews about all of his competitors, not just me, but the other competitors here in Emerald, Texas. And it was so obvious who did it. He even used his name and his own username. He was an idiot. But the point was, don't do that. In fact, I tell people, if you own a business, you never talk garbage about your competitors ever. Even if you hate them with the white, hot fury of hell, you do not talk garbage on them ever, okay? And you always talk professional. You know, if you ever have a customer come up to you and say, you know, um, I was thinking of doing business with your competitor, Jack, over here. Why shouldn't I use Jack? When a customer baits you like that, they, they want you to talk garbage on your competitor, what they do wrong, never do that. Here's what I say. I say, yeah, Jack, they're one of my competitors and I compete with them a lot, but here's how we're better. And I don't talk about what they do wrong. I talk about what I do right. Okay, so be careful of competitor trolls. You can pretty much figure those out if you follow the first thing I told you about, DMing them and trying to help. And if they don't respond to that, block them. So what do you do if, uh... What do you think about uh, blocking and deleting comments? I, I like it, but I like it, but only do it with trolls. I'm not a fan of blocking. Like if someone had a problem with my company and they posted that problem, I would respond to it publicly. That way, everyone seeing it will see that I responded. No one expects you to be perfect. And no one expects you to have all loving customers. But if you respond to it, that's what people need to see. Now, if someone wants to get into a little flame war and go back and forth, no, I'm not doing that. I'll block them at that point. When I realize they don't want a solution to their problem, they just want to be the problem, yeah. Be careful what you post. I tell business owners all the time, you got to be careful what you post, especially in this day and age. And, and trust me, I've been known to do it myself. You post something a little controversial, you've got to realize there's going to be a group of people out there who may not agree with you. And you could have just axed them off as potential customers. Okay. Uh, political and religious posts are the worst to post. Okay. They really are. Uh, and I'm just saying that. If you don't know what you're doing, I would not, as a company, venture into that. As a person, go for it. But as a company, I wouldn't. I wouldn't take a stand on certain issues as a company. Okay? Because not everyone who does business with you agrees with you. And all you're going to do is make them mad for no reason. Be proactive with angry people. 
like I said earlier, you need to reach out to them immediately. Don't ignore them. That just makes them angrier. Try to calm them down. And if you can't calm them down, block them. Shut down trolls immediately when you realize they're trolls. Don't even play with them. Don't. They will try to bait you into it. Don't. Ignore them. Block them. Move on. Rogue employee post. A lot of times it might be a drunk, angry employee post. They might even be. I had one. This actually happened to me once. I had a receptionist post on Facebook about me. Nay, something negative to all her friends on Facebook. I was one of her friends. She was gone the next day. You don't do that. Don't ever diss your boss on Facebook. Don't ever diss your company on Facebook because they have the full right to cut you loose. Don't make inappropriate posts. You know, don't post pictures that are inappropriate. Try to avoid cussing at all by all means. And whatever you do, do not let your employees complain about customers. This is another reason to be friends with all of your employees on Facebook. Sometimes your customers, especially your salespeople, uh, they may have, a, have dealt with a really hard to deal with customer. And without thinking, they may go on Facebook and complain about it. Don't do it. I actually had this happen to my company once. One of my salespeople got angry one time at one of our existing customers and he posted on Facebook. You want to know how I found out about it? The customer called me. That salesman was toast. Remember, in your company, there is no First Amendment. Okay? That's our country, not your company. In your company, you are the ruler. In your company, you make the rules and you will do whatever it is you want to do. Your employees do not have a First Amendment right to say anything they want to say. And that is key for you to understand, okay? Because unless you, unless you lay down the law and your policies and the examples you make of other employees, your, your, your company will go out of business, okay? Because it is that bad. It is that bad. Remind them the difference between personal and professional. That on the email accounts that you give them with yourcompany.com on the end of it, there better be nothing in those email accounts. Just the same as nothing in a social media post. They want to say that, use their personal, have them use their personal email account. Be sure and tell them what inappropriate is. Tell them what that is, because especially a lot of young people today, they have a totally different definition of inappropriate than someone who is 70 years old, okay? So you may need to educate your younger staff uh, and, and maybe even your older staff on what you consider inappropriate. Have a talk with them about whining about employees. If they want to whine, have them come talk to you. If they want to whine, let them do it, but not in public. That's like airing your family laundry or something. Office dislocation, I'm telling you, if you, if you have to be in your office to do business, then the pandemic has taught you something. And a lot of those companies did go out of business. Have a remote working plan, okay? You have to have a plan on what you're going to do uh, if something happens. Uh, and now I bet every one of you do, actually. Also, what are your expectations of employees? What are you expecting from them? Sometimes they don't know. They worked at their last job, and so they're just going off on what the expectations there were. Talk to them. Tell them what you expect. Don't surprise them with sudden rules they didn't know about. They deserve better than that. An oversight. You got to stay on top of it. You got to be checking their Facebooks. You got to be keeping an, eye, keeping an eye on that because your company depends on it. And you need to check your own company's reputation online. Don't buy one of those reputation defender things. Those are garbage. All you need to do is Google your own company online and just see what's being said about you. And, you know, do searches. Google your 
company and your name on Facebook, see what people are saying about you. There's even something called Google Alerts. You can sign up for that when Google finds something new, mentioning any word you want, it'll alert you. Totally free, it's called Google Alerts. Just Google it. Huh. And with that, and I know we went one minute over, but if y'all can still hang around, I wanna answer any questions that you might have. I have one last question. I know we've gone over and people are um, may have been having lunch and doing this, and uh, but do you think that there's one industry that's more um, susceptible to uh, attacks or do you think it's just across the board? It's across the board. It's, it's everyone right now is hypersensitive. Uh, right or wrong, good or bad, we are all hypersensitive. And so the smallest slight, especially with all the pressure and stress we are under because of the pandemic and right now electricity going out and everything, cut some people some slack. And before you go off and be angry or sarcastic or passive online or something, just maybe reel it in a little bit. That's all. But every business, every business, every business. Okay, we do have a question. I'm going to allow uh, talk. Anna, whenever you're ready. Caller, go ahead. Hi. This is Anna Golden, and I wanted to ask you, I don't understand a lot of all this uh, stuff, but I understand that there is different type of clouds, and how do you know which cloud to use and be sure? I am a mental health counselor, and I need to, I haven't put things in the cloud because I'm scared of information to be there. Uh, that, that is a wonderful question. What I tell people is bigger is better. You know, I would rather go to Google or Amazon or one of the big companies rather than Uncle Howard's cloud in a box in his garage. You know what I'm saying? So the bigger, the better. QuickBooks Cloud, great. You know, national companies, I would go with. If you've never heard of them, that's when I would get nervous. But here's what you need to do. You, you said you work in the mental health industry. You have an association. Uh, that kind of represents all of you. What I would do is I would call someone at the association and say, are there any uh, resources that you recommend us use for this or that? You know what I'm saying? I guarantee you they have preferred vendors that they've already checked out. Thank you. Mm. Great question. We have another question. What is the best way to secure iPhones? <laughs> Destroy them. Really? You know, when it comes to an iPhone, just make sure you have a password on it. You know, even if it's just a four digit uh, thing just to keep people out of it. But if you're talking about how to keep people from copying stuff to their iPhone, you really can't. iPhone is the hardest one to do that too because Apple controls all that. Um, like I said, I would, like I said, if you're trying to keep people off of your iPhone, then I will just use the standard, you know, pass key. But if you're trying to like limit what kids can go look at and stuff on an iPhone or what information can be copied to it, that's a lot more difficult. I think we are just about done. I know we're over time and uh, well, that was some great information. So um, Eric, you will be back with us on Friday. Yes, or, I will. Yeah. Oh, so. Uh, again, for uh, lunch on Friday, e-commerce and disaster recovery. So um, anybody needs anything, just email me your questions and hopefully we can uh, pick them up again with Eric on our next. I'll program. be there. See you then. All right, see you. Okay.